and the implications that would have for a country that has less than two months to go to a major general election that many people describe as a watershed one. Hello, good evening and welcome to Agenda. My name is Beatrice Edu, and tonight we are looking at the rippling security implications of what's happening between Parliament and the judiciary, or to be specific, the Supreme Court of Ghana. I'm sure you remember that in the last few days, we've been talking about uh, the decision by Alban Bagbin, the Speaker of the House, actually the ruling, uh, that declared four seats vacant because the individuals occupying those seats have declared their intentions to run independent. And shortly, less than 24 hours after the Speaker gave that ruling, the Supreme Court also decided to give its decision asking Parliament to stay that ruling until it has come out, as it were, with its final ruling on this. So we are going to look at the implications of uh, these banter uh, or, or interactions between the Supreme Court of Ghana and the Parliament of the Republic. And I do have with me here on my right side is Dr. Ishmael Yamsin. He's an economist and a respected businessman. Good evening to you, sir. Thank you, Thank you so much. much for joining us. Thank you. I also have on my immediate uh, left, Gary Nimako. He's the Director of Legal uh, Affairs for the Governing New Patriotic Party. Good evening to you, sir. Thank you for joining us. Good evening, Beatrice. Mm. And, of course, we also have with us Francis Poco. Francis Poco is a former National Security Coordinator. He graduated to be, become the Minister of the National Security Secretariat. Good evening to you, sir. Thank you also for joining us. Thank you very much. I know that you've been uh, following this discussion, so we'll go very uh, straight into it. Uh, uh, let me first find out from you what you make of the interactions that have been happening after... You know, the Speaker of Parliament gave its ruling that four seats be declared vacant because the constitutions of both the MPP and NDC declare so that indeed when somebody declares the intention to either cross carpet or become independent, the person loses their, their status, as it were, in Parliament. Let me first get your initial comment. Well, I have followed with interest uh, the various uh, constitutional arguments about the sovereignty of uh, Parliament about uh, the interference with the, uh, uh, the, the rights of Parliament, and then also question of uh, jurisdiction, etc. But what has concerned me as a security person is where we go from here. Uh, what is the impact of uh, the various arguments we are advancing here and there. How is this going to affect us? Uh, this is also a very critical period of our history. And I have looked uh, at the, the current developments. The fact that for 31 years, uh, we have been able to sustain our democratic practices. So this is something to be very proud of. And when we refer to what you call national power, that is how the international community look upon us. How do they perceive us in terms of being able to measure up to our various challenges? You think we sunk low with what is happening? Well, this is what we all want to examine. Where is it taking us? See, it's nice to hear all the constitutional and legal arguments. Yes, it's been well uh, dealt with by various experts. Uh, we don't lack experts in this country. There are a lot of them. But then, at the end of the day, we have to look at the way we are perceived in terms of uh, law enforcement, in terms of stability, uh, whether we are able to uh, meet the requirements of a stable nation. Uh, these are your preliminary comments, but I want to refer you to a, a comment or a word you used, which is interference. Before I move on to Gary and then I'll come to Dr. Ishmael Yamsin, do I hear you say that what has happened with the Supreme Court asking Parliament to stay its decision or ruling is a clear interference of another independent arm trying to interfere with the other? No, uh, that is not the point I made. I say I have followed the various arguments, but what concerns me is what we make out of the current situation in terms of 
our nation's stability? What are the dangers that we could easily encounter? So at some point, we have to leave out the arguments and focus on where we are. Our survival, the survival of our democracy. So I wouldn't want here to deal with the legal issue. It must come to an end. There must be an end to litigation. There see? must be an end to litigation, and you say. Where, where we see that there are dangers confronting a nation, then we have to sit down and weigh the consequences of what is going Do on. Do you see danger so, ahead? So as a security person, that is what I want to look at. Do you at. see danger ahead? Well, obviously, if we are not able to arrest the situation, it is a test of our stability uh, as a democratic nation. I want and, to get your preliminary... that is where my interest is. That's where your interest is. I want to get your preliminary thoughts, uh, uh, Gary, because now if you listen to the whole argument going on, yes, NDC is insisting that it will, keep, it will hold on to its majority status, as it were, because that's what the Speaker ruled, per the right of the Speaker or uh, Parliament's Order 18 to declare such a thing. And yet, others are also arguing that the MPP had no business going to court even before the resumption of Parliament, and perhaps your action is actually the reason we are concerned about tensions in the system. Yeah, good evening, uh, Beatrice, and uh, I think it's uh, refreshing to see two prominent, distinguished personalities in this country at the table with us to discuss this particular matter. Let me state that there is no interference with the judiciary in the, in the, in the work of Parliament. That's the first point. The second point is that in this country, we have... Uh, 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 constitutional supremacy, not parliamentary supremacy. I think you have to article one of the constitution. One, two, you say the constitution shall be the supreme law of Ghana. That is the reason why when parliament enacts any law and that law is found to be inconsistent with the constitution, the Supreme Court is able to intervene to strike it down as null, void, and of no effect. If it's not so, the parliament can make any law. When they make the law, the law will be there. You cannot strike it down. But you know we are not dealing with law now. Now, let me, let me come here. Article 2 of the Constitution, 2.1b. A person who alleges that any act or omission of any person, any person includes the president, the vice president, myself, uh, uh, the speaker of parliament, any person, is inconsistent with or in contravention of a provision of this constitution may bring an action to the Supreme Court for a declaration to that effect. Anything, any person. Now, I have before me here a read that was filed by Honorable Fenyo Markin on the 15th of October 2024. And that's why I'll hold you on. You read Article 2 right now, right? Yes. And that was an article I was actually going to. And I know that over the days, we've dealt really into the legality and all of that of what we are dealing with. But Article 2, is the summary of it is that you're dealing with actuals because somebody has, quote-unquote, evidence that something is wrong. A am I not right? That is why they say, if you allege. Exactly. If you allege. But before, before the Speaker of Parliament could make any pronouncement on what was happening, the Speaker had not even declared the seats vacant yet, and Apanyo Markin had already gone to court. Let me explain to you. A writ is pending with the accompanying injunction application on 15th of October, 2024. Among the reliefs was simply tied the hands of the Speaker to even discuss or make a declaration to that effect, to make the decision vacant. The, the speaker ignored these processes, proceeds to deal with the matter, and declared the decision vacant. What has she done? What has he done? What he has done is more or less contempt of parliament, of, of, of the Supreme Court. Now, you know that what the speaker has done again is that post the declaration, he makes Mr. Ebenezer Ahuma Dijeto right to the, to, the, to, the, to, to the register of the Supreme Court to return the competencies to the court. M Mr. Garin, are, you, are you getting my point? I, I get what you're saying, but the argument is that the MPP group in Parliament is jumping the gun. And the reason is that you just read Article 2, and I just talked about the actuals, the fact that the Speaker had not even declared a seat vacant yet, and Apenyo Markin went ahead Somebody and did Somebody is making an allegation, Okay. There is a certain conduct of yours 
a certain thing that you want to do, that thing is in with the constitution. What you want to do is in with the constitution. So don't do it. Are you, are you following my argument? I'm saying Beatrice is going to go to this particular area. What you are going to do, please don't go there. When you do, you have violated the constitutional provision. Why do you put separation of powers? Separation of powers, when yes. Parliament, the judiciary, the legislature, and the executive have equal rights, and none is above. And yet, you have a Supreme Court that wants to tell Parliament what to do when it hasn't even you finished say, with the you process. Say, if, yet. if you say none is above, then I think you have really misconstrued the Constitution. Because you see, the Constitution gives the Supreme Court. Let me let me continue with it so that you get the full import of where, where I'm coming from. And this one is Article Article Two Two. The Supreme Court shall, and it's a, it's a mandatory provision, shall, for the purpose of declaration under clause one of this article, make such orders or give such directions as it may consider appropriate for giving effect or enabling effect to be given to the declaration so made. Let's go to the three. Any person or group of person to whom an order or direction is addressed under, the, under clause two of this article, by the Supreme Court shall duly obey and carry the terms of the said order or direction. Now, if the Supreme, if the, if the, if Parliament, as you are saying, cannot be directed by the Supreme Court, why is the Supreme Court doing this? The Constitution made the Supreme Court the power to do to do it. But Parliament, the the, the same Constitution uh, yes. also gives individual rights to these institutions that yes. are supposed to function without interference. There is no interference. So I will come back to Beatrice, you. Let me get hold on, hold on, hold on. Let's, let's get this thing clear. There is no interference because, you see, if there's Constitution that gives the Supreme Court the power to do what it's doing, and, you, and it's saying that if they give you direction, orders, or whatever, you don't even obey, it's high crime. It is here. It is high crime. But you see, and if you are a president, if you are a president, if you may, let me let me explain what people will understand. The Supreme Court, when they give directions, orders, and you do not obey, if you are the president of the Republic of Ghana, it can lead to your impeachment. That is without a doubt, but not at a time when another arm of government, yes. because we have three independent arms of government, yes. is doing its rights or it's doing uh, what it has to do within its own remit per the definition of the Constitution as well. But I will come back to you, Mr. Nimako, because I want to get the preliminary thoughts as well of Dr. Ishmael Yamsin. Well, thank you very much, and, uh, Beatrice and my colleagues. I, it's the first time I'm meeting uh, my distinguished lawyer face to face. I've listened to you a number of times on, on television. <clears throat> I'm very worried as a Ghanaian. <clears throat> I'm not a lawyer. Um, and uh, I enjoy listening to legal arguments, but our constitution starts with, in the name of the Almighty God, we, the people of Ghana. Therefore, everything that we do, whether it is parliament, whether it's the executive, whether it is the judiciary, it must serve the best interest of the people of this country. Now, Mr. Poku made a point which I'm very much interested in. What is the end point? When you make all the arguments, and let us remember, we are at a point in time of our history where I have not seen such tension in this country before. You feel it right now? Oh, yes. Um, the two um, leading parties, <laughs> if I want to win, <laughs> Uh, one wants to win, one wants to retain. And there, there's very heightened tension in this country. And that is why I think that every action of every arm of government is done with great circumspect. The, the rush to parliament, the uh, sorry, the rush to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court order, which, by the way, is ex parte. Eh? Yes. You want to court on ex parte basis, which may or may not allow the defendant the right to present his argument. That was wrong in your opinion? Well, given the time we have in, is it right? That's my point, because that's why I'm saying we should be very circumspect, because we have faced with many, many problems in this country. We have economic problems. 
we, last week you were discussing, was it last week we were discussing Galapse, which for me is existential. We have problems of, you know, hardship. And the least we want to do is to add to these problems. And let me, let me say this, that if Supreme Court, as my, the learned lawyer is saying, uh, if Parliament doesn't obey the Supreme Court, it commits an offence. <laughs> the, the, the Parliament can, or the Speaker can also cite Parliament for contempt, right? As in the wrong. speaker can cite the Supreme yeah, Court for contempt. Right or wrong. Yes. And so we have this tango. We have six, seven ways to election. Why do we want to create such tension in this country? What is the necessity for it? So why is it that whatever the issues are, before running to court, could the party that is in court today not have done anything at all? Was it absolutely necessary to run to court for an order, which the speaker would definitely resist. And what if the speaker says, okay, fine. And I, I, I'm coming here, I just uh, looked at the reliefs or the reasons for the, for the, uh, for the grounds for the, the, what was sought in Parliament. The first one is the likely mischief being a halt to the business of parliament. It's a likely mischief, not proving. Likelihood of the current minority members doing everything in their power to halt business of government, and on and on. That, are we suggesting here that we can never have in this country a situation where the presidency doesn't have majority in parliament? The party of the presidency doesn't have majority in parliament, and that will amount to stopping government business. That's not true. It happens in many democracies. Therefore, even if that, is, that were be, to be true, is that is the best way to approach this is to create a crisis of something that has not even materialized? So you're saying that the action of Arpeño marking in the first place is what is generating this exactly, tension we are Exactly so. Because you just said that the... the, the the speaker has not declared the seat vacant yet. Yes. So why don't you wait? Now you go to to go to Supreme Court. The Supreme Court immediately says, "Gives an order, stop it for ten days." I don't know. I haven't seen the Supreme Court order, but I don't know the reason the Supreme Court gave or whether they gave any reasons at all. But the ten days, what will happen is exactly what Afia uh, Markin is seeking to avoid. Parliament won't work. Parliament will not work. So government business will come to a standstill in those 10 days. So what have we achieved then? So what I'm saying is that we should be mindful of the interest of the people of Ghana. We don't, the people of this country don't want crisis. The people of this country don't want tension. The people of this country have had enough. And I think that the least we can do is to give them peace and stability. We are toying with the stability of this country. And I don't think it's the right thing to do. We are toying with the stability of this country and you don't think that's the right no. thing to do. Those are your preliminary comments. But I want to come back to you, uh, Mr. Poku, because you said that in, in the midst of all of that, we should see where this is leading us to. Is it leading us to a stable country? or it is going to destabilize us. And you just heard uh, Dr. Ishmael Yamsin there really talking about how many days we have to this year's election. And I, 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 wanted to, I wanted you to give us more of what you fear, really, going into this year's general election with what is happening now by quoting what the national security, current national security minister said, Albert Kandapa. In, he said exactly on the 8th of April, 2022, that a biased judiciary poses a serious threat to national security as it erodes public trust in the justice system and emboldens lawlessness. You were talking about some fears earlier. With this in perspective, what do you foresee? Yes, while well, we are going through these challenges, where we must be very much conscious of the security realities around us. Um, first of all, I always want to go back to what we have achieved in security terms. 
Historically, we are aware of Ghana when, of what Ghana went through before the 1992 constitution. It's a long period of instability. And for once, Ghana, through the collaboration of various stakeholders, was able to have a constitution. We've been able to sustain it, as I said, for 31 years. So something to be proud of is a marker of our stability. It's a national power, the way we are perceived internationally and then also nationally. So we should be conscious of that. We have a very good parliament. I was, when I was a minister, for me, the security safety was parliament. Anytime we have security challenges, I was very proud to go, for instance, to the uh, Defense and Interior Subcommittee, able to be able to solicit their wisdom. So parliament has been where sensible com compromises have been reached over the period, whenever we had national challenges. But you wouldn't say that the parliament we had at the time you were minister is the same parliament we have now? The same parliament. We have a very strong parliamentary tradition in this country. And they are able to, able to reach consensus whenever the nation is in crisis. At this that is where we have run to in security terms whenever there was trouble. At this stage, there doesn't so seem to be I a consensus. I have been very nervous about the developments, and I'm very confident that if we allow Parliament to examine this issue, they will be able to reach a consensus. And there is no better parliamentarian in terms of consensus than uh, the Speaker Babin. He has been able to sustain parliament during periods of crisis. And we have other parliamentarians, uh, uh, very solid. So if we allow parliament the opportunity to explore, explore the current issues, they will be sensible enough to resolve this issue. So let's be capable, uh, let's try and reflect on our tradition. And as you said, this is a very difficult period. We just before elections. There's a lot of government business that need to be done. So we must be conscious. And also around us in West Africa, we have challenges. There's a hell. So the security services are having a look at the developments around us. So it's a very difficult period. And also, we must be aware of the fact that this is a very troublesome election. And that should be the national focus. Do we want to weaken the foundations of state? And what are the foundations? The judiciary, the, uh, the executive, and parliament. These are the foundations of our democracy. And we don't want to taint either parliament or the judiciary. Do I hear you say when you say we want to weaken do I understand that I mean, you think what is happening is weakening Speaking generally, in, among the, uh, the political uh, uh, behavior, whatever is happening, we must be able to promote the integrity of parliament, integrity of the judiciary, and the integrity of the executive. How do you do so? You are former national security Well, minister. this is where... An issue like this can drag everybody into the mud. Now you look at what happened on the floor of parliament. We don't want to see that. You are tainting parliament, the dignity of parliament. Look at the chief justice being dragged into this decision. I don't say he's right or wrong. I'm not here to inquire into the... The procedures are. But you are a national security but minister. You should be able to have an yes, idea. Yes, I deal who with the situation and right. and when they arrive, but I don't inquire necessarily into the logic of what has happened. But when it has stand? happened, it has happened. Where do you stand? I stand in the resolution of conflict. Because the the, pro, the, the 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 argument of others is that we've had a number of cases before the Supreme Court. 
and sometimes people are asking for expedite processes and, and rulings. And you have uh, the Speaker of Parliament declaring that the seats are vacant. In less than 24 hours, another arm of government judiciary comes in to say, stay this ruling until we have ruled on the matter. You don't have a stance on, well, on yeah, this? Well, I'm looking at the political cases or quasi-political case. This is a political case. This could be divisive. And that is why we should be cautious about the way we deal with what is happening. Because we are dealing with government business at a very critical period of our history. But is it all about government business or it's also about really, like uh, Dr. Ishmael Yamsin said, about the interests of Ghana? It's about the interest of Ghana, and that is why it is very important. There must be no winners or losers. What is happening now, I think, in security practice, we go behind closed doors to find out where this case is leading us. Because if there is, if, for instance, the security services, military, police, are dragged into the floor of parliament, you can imagine the crisis. Is that, that what you foresee through. happening? Well, what I'm saying is that we hope it doesn't. But if it happens, you are, at this, you are going to taint. You see, a lot of institutions are going to be tainted, and we don't want it. These are the foundations of democracy. I want to ask you one more, and then I'll come to Gary. You said if we allow parliament. I just wanted clarity on that. Are you saying that the Supreme Court should just stay off and allow parliament to go about its all business? All stakeholders in the country must come together to ensure that this process is contained. Where all stakeholders mean which stakeholders? Stakeholders, anybody, all the uh, stakeholders and those who can come on board to try and bring a bit of calm and wisdom into the process. It's just beginning, but it could go out of control. Ms. Anwakwa, I wanted to come to you, and it's a point that Dr. Ishmael Yamsi made earlier, that this whole writ we are talking about is even ex-party, and the argument is that what is the rush? No, the, Parliament... writ, the writ is not ex-party. Okay, but it the was... Writ, see, if you, let, it me, was... let me explain for your audience to understand. The writ is not ex-party. The writ was issued on notice. The injunction was issued on notice to hold the process all on notice. It is the application to stay the proceedings. That was when ex-party. Yes, that's what I'm talking yeah, so about. So you can't so say that it was ex-party. Yes, so ex-party <laughs> So let me explain. Just, I, yes. I'm not done with my question Okay. Yet. The application ex-party, and the argument is that what is the rush? Because I'm sure you remember very well that case between uh, Equam versus Pianim when, you know, uh, Rosemary wanted to uh, prevent PNM from contesting, and the Supreme Court eventually said, you can't use X party, MPP has to be served. And other people are arguing that we seem to be having a similar situation. I, I There's think, no rush. I don't think you can compare Equam and PNE to a serious governance issue like this particular one. It's a serious governance issue, and a matter where a parliament is being used, uh, Speaker is using the parliament to reconfigure parliament. And the right? majority... Please, please. A majority is now being made a minority. A minority is now being made a majority through reconfiguring. Re and you think is the speaker is, doing is, is, it? Of course. But your own if the speaker, If the speaker, uh -huh. wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You are just interrupting me too much. If the speaker has stayed her, his hands off, has been served with a rate of summons and injunction application, and I say, okay, you file application even to restrain me, and I've been served, duly been served. Look, it's a letter here. Why the speaker made the process to return back to back to the back to, to the judiciary, and you think that that is right? That you have, have, wait, wait, wait. Having been served with the process of court, you now ask your your, your deputy clerk, Ebenezer Jeto, to return the process back back to back to back to to, 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 to the court, and then you to give, give a ruling on the matter. That's not a practice of procedure. The president puts here, once you are served with the injunction, think to receive for doing something, you want to stay your hands. That is how we do with the practice law. We stay your hands. And I let the Supreme Court abide by whatever the Supreme Court will come out with. But you don't do that. You proceed to make the, 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 what do you call it, orders on the verdict that they are complaining about. That's, that is wrong. So let me come in here. Article 18 of, um, not Article 18, Order 18 of the, one of the standing orders of Parliament yes. allows the Speaker to implement 
some of these things within its own jurisdiction. Again, the speaker was looking at, just like Professor Michael Quinn, like I said, this is a conversation we've been having through the week. The speaker was referring to the MPP's own Article 39, which talks about when a person crosses carpet or decides to go independent. So you're accusing the speaker of using parliament to, as it were, enforce a political agenda. You, you but see, the other side of the argument see, is also that, just let me land, <laughs> before Apenyo Makin went to court, mm. the speaker had not even declared any seat vacant per Article 2 of the Constitution see, that I talked about that, as actual. That is why the Supreme Court said, the Supreme Court said, there are serious legal and constitutional matters to be considered in the rich. Okay? And the court also said, there are real questions of constitutional interpretation and application of the, of the fundamental rights. The people that you are saying that you are not representing in parliament, they voted for somebody. The person came to parliament. Now, when it comes to the issue of which has, uh, which has the power to, to declare that a, a provision or a constitution in terms of uh, it's vacant, it's a high court. It's a high court. The high court has the power to declare a seat vacant. But Apenyo went to Supreme Court. I am saying that when it comes to declaration of where a seat is vacant, it's a high court. It's a high court, not a speaker. You see, when matters of law and politics are mixed up, and somebody is alleging that, in my view, hold your hands, let's get a court to do the interpretation of the Constitution and enforcement, and then you, 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 you ignore it, even though you have been served, you ignore it, and proceed to make... The variety said, don't do it. You do the same thing. And we'll be going for and it. And when you finish, when, after doing it, when you finish, you now ask your clerk to send the, the documents back to the court. We'll be, we'll, we'll be going for a break very And you think shortly, that this, this, this is proper? This argument you're speaker? making, and I, I, don't, I don't want us to go back and forth on this, because it is the same argument that we've been talking about or making since this discussion, which is on Article 97, when it was convenient for the then Professor Michael Okwe to declare the seat vacant for Formina to run independent. He went ahead and did it, but now it has come to this point, and the MPP doesn't think that this article of the Constitution is Clear if I may, I may respond to you in, in just one second. At the time when Michael Kwe proceeded to do what he did, was there a court case pending against him? But Apenyo rushed just before was Parliament Was there a resumed. court case pending? You see, every factual situation ought to be looked at in a different context. There's a court case which has been filed. This was filed on the 18th of, of October, 2024. Okay? And then you proceed to do what you did. You don't think that Apenyo rushing to the court... Even before Why the speaker, just a court? second, just a second. <laughs> Even before the speaker could declare the seat vacant, was another way of bending the speaker's hand into following, as it were, the constitutional or the legalities that you talk about right here. You see, you see, the speaker do not have the power to do interpretation of the constitution. Somebody is alleging that something that you are going to do or something that you are, you are doing. It falls the Constitution. So let the Supreme Court come in to do the interpretation and the enforcement. A power vested with the Supreme Court alone. No other power. No other power with, 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 the, with, the, with the Speaker of Parliament. So hold on your hands. Don't push. Don't proceed. And then you proceed. Having proceeded, you now take the, 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 the writ, the injunction application, add a letter to it, and send it back to the court. You think this is proper to do as a Speaker of Parliament? Look. Let's be fair to all the parties. Once a party has filed a case in court, just tie your hands. Tie your hands. Why, why, why is there a rush? Why was the rush in going to make the pronouncement on the very thing they said, don't do it? Why was the rush? That's the point I'm making. Why was the rush? You don't think that you're accusing the speaker of exactly what the MPP is doing in parliament? That is not exactly what. The, what's your question again? It's accusing him of what? I am saying that when the rate was filed with injunction and he was served through the legal office and he became aware and the hands are so clear that in fact and indeed the speaker was aware that he had been served with the process. That is a, this is a hazard of, this is a hazard of, the, of, the, of, the, of the proceedings, okay? That he had been served. The question is, why the rush? Why the rush? Why didn't he wait for the Supreme Court to make a rule on the matter? And he decided to do the very thing he was being... In, so so, so that's, what, that's what I'm asking you. You're accusing the speaker of rushing to go ahead when there is a court process to pay attention to. And people are asking the same question of why Apenyo Markin would go 
Because Even before the speaker would have the you opportunity see, to you make see, any you see, my dear Beatrice, when it comes to matters of constitutional interpretation and enforcement, it is the power vested only in the Supreme Court. And I think what they And I'll come back to you. Uh, you see, you know, it's, a, it's the Supreme Court that should do it. They've got the power that is vested in the, in, the, in the speaker to do. And you're watching Agenda right here on TV3. When we come back, we'll bring you really uh, some of the implications. We've already spoken about them, but going into this year's general election, the security implications of some of these actions and insistence on both sides of the house to want to hold on to either majority or minority. And then we'll get some answers really as regards how to avoid this going into the December 7th general election. Don't go away. And you're watching Agenda on TV3 and we've been talking about the security and rippling implications of the fight, as it were, between the Supreme Court and the Parliament of Ghana and all the arguments coming from it. We've touched a little bit on really what could happen if we don't resolve this issue right now. We're going to go more into that, but I'm sure ahead of that, I'm sure you're aware that the, ma, the NDC group in Parliament says that it is going with the ruling of the Speaker, which has declared the group the majority in the House, whilst the MPP is also saying that it will... It it will resist that attempt because there's already a Supreme Court decision, as it were, asking Parliament to stay this ruling uh, by the Speaker of Parliament. And I'm coming to you, uh, former National Security uh, uh, Coordinator and Minister Francis Poku. Uh, you were talking about the need for us to nip this in the bud before it degenerates into, uh, you know, something that the country wouldn't want to see. But I'm just wondering how you see what is happening, influencing the base of particular Clearly, the NDC and NPP in our various constituencies. Yeah, I'll make the point that we've almost exhausted the constitutional and legal arguments. So now let's look ahead at this troublesome time. And we need both parties. Meanwhile, after all, they've been part and parcel of the 1992 constitution. They have played their part to, uh, to make it succeed. So things can go wrong. And this is why we have to be careful. I have referred to the integrity of the institutions that are guiding us. The, the judiciary, this time the Supreme Court, executive that is responsible for the enforcement of the law, and parliament. And these <coughs> organs have been very critical in the success of the 1992 constitution. So as a nation, we need to restore our national power, our national dignity. The fact that laws can work in this country. The fact that we can rise to the occasion whenever there's crisis. And this has been done several times in Parliament. We've been able to keep the Supreme Court away as much as possible. The moment we bring in other institutions, we are tainting them in the eyes of the public. We are politicizing them. So this is what we have to focus on at the moment. We've listened to all the arguments on this issue. And I think time is running out. We are getting very close to the election, and we must be focused. If not, we're going to have radicalization. The leaders are there, but they are followers. And if we are not careful, we are just preparing them for radicalization and violent extremism. To get to a point when weapons can come in. And I'm very uncomfortable about enforcement of the Supreme Court uh, injunction. Not that the Supreme Court is wrong, yes, but in scrutiny matters, you put away sometimes your rights. So the Supreme Court we the have had, didn't implement this? We have had challenges, but we've dealt with them outside the law. When the law is becoming divisive, not that it's a bad law or not because the enforcers are wrong, I don't want now to make judgments on that. So what we now have to do, enough is enough. Let us focus on national interest. But I want to get your point clear because you seem to be in the middle as you're talking, or that's the understanding I'm well, getting. Well, that is how you. we have are dealt. Are you saying that this, the parliament should ignore the That is why the we, are, we have dealt with several issues behind the scenes. When things are going to, 
we are getting out of hand. We retire behind this. Should scene. Parliament ignore and that is the, the Supreme Court? The tradition Court? of this country, even in local matters, in family mm -hmm. matters, when uh, things are getting out of control, we know how to move into a recess of some sort and find other solutions. The law is not everything. The law is not everything, so Parliament shouldn't respect this thing. No, of that is there. We've, we've, we've gone past that uh, uh, stage. Now, I believe now we have to look at the security dimension because there's degeneration, and that is what I'm worried about. I'm coming to you, uh, Dr. Ishmael Yamsin, uh, really, uh, just asking you the same question. Perhaps I would add one more of how you see this uh, radicalizing, using the words of Francis, uh, Mr. Francis Poku there, the base of these two political parties and really the rippling effects this could have on us. I mean, you are an economist. We already know what's happening in Boko because of conflict. <clears throat> well, thank you very much. Before I answer the question, <clears throat> uh, let me just uh, <clears throat> make reference to the, the comment the uh, learned lawyer made that the, I think he agreed that there has been a precedent uh, of this matter before. But the question is, was there a matter before uh, the Supreme Court at the time that Michael Quay made the decision? So then I, I mean, anybody can argue that um, there was resort to the Supreme Court because the president would justify what the speaker was going to say. Now, having said that, let me just say that, look, this country has far too many uncertainties. And this is creating a very big uncertainty for Ghana. Uh, I have been in the corporate world for many, many years. The last thing any investor wants is uncertainty, especially if it has to do with politics and insecurity. The way we are going, maybe the two parties are very um, happy, you know, in the mode that they are at the moment. But the constitution was not written by NPP or was not written for either NPP or for the NDC. It was written for the people of Ghana. And anything that any of these parties do, which will not further the interest of the people of Ghana, should be avoided. Should be avoided. Um, we've been independent for 67 years. And I can tell you that today, we are nowhere near where our, uh, you know, forefathers ever believed that we should be. Why? Because we have done far too much politics with our country. We have done far too much politics with Ghana. That's why we are where we are today. We, nobody eats politics. Nobody goes to the shop to buy politics. But people, countries have surpassed us. Countries that have been at war for many years. Rwanda. Now, today, our upper middle income economies. Why does it that worry us? Why should we be bothered about a few people sitting in parliament who believe that because they are right or wrong, everybody else must suffer? I think that uh, for me, what the Supreme Court has done, I am not a lawyer, and I cannot judge whether it's right or wrong, but what I know now is that there's been a precedent before. Mm. If there has been a precedent before, so the issue then is that is the, the speaker should have waited uh, for the Supreme Court to say what they were going to say before he declared the, 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 the cease breaker. Is that the reason why we should drive this country to a brink of huge acute uncertainty? And we can toy with this country if we want to. But I don't think that the future generations of this country want to go through what we have gone through in the past 67 years. The Nobody wants to. The understanding I'm getting is that you think both MPP and NDC are just, you know, uh, playing politics with this and putting their interests ahead of the country's interests. No, I'm saying that this matter could have been dealt with or could still be dealt with by building consensus of both parties. And I think the Supreme Court should have stayed away from this matter. 
And I still believe that rushing to the Supreme Court was not the best, was not in the best interest of Ghana. That has created more problems, and it will create more problems for this country than we think and we can see. Gary Nimako doesn't agree with that point, and I'm well, sure you heard I him am, make his I point. I am happy that he does not agree because <laughs> uh, uh, you know, democracy is about ideas, isn't it? So he can disagree. But for me, whether he agrees or not, at the end of the day, I ask one very simple question. Is it in the best interest of this country at this time in our history to do what we are doing? to do what the parliamentarians are doing, and to do what the Supreme Court is doing. If it is in the best interest of Ghana and its people, yes. But I don't believe that it is the best interest of this country and its people. And I think we should take a step back and rethink and reflect on what the implications of this is going to be. Because we all know, and it's something that everybody knows that we have three arms of government. Whether the Supreme Court has been uh, given the, uh, the right to interpret laws or not, why was the Constitution, what the Constitution also provide for, you know, the independence of the judiciary, the independence of the parliament, the independence of the executive? Why? Why did the, Supreme, the, 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 the Constitution simply say the Supreme Law resides in, not in the people but in the Supreme Court? It didn't say that. Right? So even in the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court in its own judgment must also be cognizant of the implications of the things that they do, of the decisions they make. We are talking about human rights. There are people somewhere in the, in the border region who never had representation in parliament throughout this, this, the life of this parliament. Do they have rights? They too have rights. They too have rights that have been abused completely. So for me, I'm old enough to say, I don't want to go through any crisis anymore. I think common sense should prevail. Consensus should be, should be built between the two parties. Supreme Court must weigh its own interpretation and its actions and see whether it will promote Ghana's interest and the people of Ghana, the internal people, or not. There are those who think that the swift uh, decision or intervention of the Supreme Court funds the idea that perhaps it has become political now. Do you, st do you share that opinion? You know, that is a risk, I think, we, I see in this country. And I think it's a risk we should avoid. I, wa I, I worry when I hear people say the Supreme Court has been packed with uh, uh, sympathizers of the the ruling party. And I don't want to hear that. I think people should, be, should go to the Supreme Court, uh, uh, Supreme Court on merit. They should merit it. You know, when you listen to American uh, uh, television and comment, commentators, they say the, 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 the Supreme Court of America is now a Republican Supreme Court. That's how they describe it. But you see, America has got institutions that can safeguard the interest and security of America. We don't have it in this country. We don't have it in this no. country. And I, I want to get your final thoughts, all of you, but I'm coming to you first, uh, Mr. Poku. Hey, you, you, you give me a bite. Yes, you, you'll come, I'll come to you. I'll, I'll go to him, and then I'll come to you. Because really, I'm looking for solutions. I mean, you can I'll give me solutions. Yes, I'll come to you, but let me just get a quick word from Mr. Poku, and then I'll come to you. Where we are now, We've just heard uh, Dr. Ishmael Yamsin saying that we don't need another crisis. I know you talked about consultations behind closed doors. What do we need to do in order not to get into the crisis? If you can uh, give us this in about well, 40 not seconds. We have to avoid crisis because I have been there before. <laughs> and now the exclusive agencies are overstretched. I know what it takes to prepare for election. And especially for a very controversial election that we're going to go through. So they are overstretched. They wouldn't want to have more crisis to deal with. At the moment, they are dealing with the Sahel states. We have one country where the rebels have taken over 80%. And at the moment, we need to find the resources to be able to deal with the challenges. We have refugees coming over. They have to do the screening of refugees, etc. We have election observers coming. We need the resources. And then also, we need to look at our economy, the challenges of Galamse. So there are a lot of problems. 
And post-election, whoever comes must have enough resources to be able to deal with unemployment and other issues that create. We have government business that must continue. Well, if we move into this crisis, government business will be stalled. So these are all contributors to instability of a nation. So uh, we cannot afford this crisis we because can... parliament will come to a halt. And with that government business, it's too serious. We cannot... It's going to divide the nation. If we undertake certain actions, it's going to divide there's discreet forces, it's going to divide the nation, it's going to divert our focus from this already serious challenges that we are going through. And I'm coming to you, uh, Ms. Animako. Really, what you think we can do beyond the politics to ensure that we have a stable country going into this year's general election? First of all, let me state <coughs> that the uh, intervention of the Supreme Court was very swift good for our democracy, considering the nature of and the commentary that was going on by the NDC, that they were going to change parliamentary committees, they were going to change uh, uh, laws, they were going to do form a majority and do all sorts of things. What would have happened if we had waited up to now? What would have happened? So I think the Supreme Court staying the balance of power and saying that I have stayed, I have stayed the order. It didn't quash the order. It stayed the order. Now, let me do an inquiry. And I think what they did was in the best interest of the country. And you still disagree that it was an interference? It cannot be an interference. That somebody has started the a process the Supreme and you Court, want to tell Supreme, it. I, I said, I've been giving you the law, but you, you don't have interest in the law I'm giving you. The Supreme Court was doing what it considered appropriate to give an effect to Article 2.1. They said, they, they, they're doing their work. They were doing their work. You don't seem to be interested in the law I'm giving you. The court didn't act ultra virus. The court acted within the law. Within the law. Well, and so parliament, know. parliament or the speaker, this afternoon I was coming here and I, was, I heard that the bailiff of the court are going to serve speaker uh, through the, the law office. And they were started a service. It means that tomorrow, everybody should go to parliament and go and stay exactly where they used to be used to stay. Parliament cannot afford to ignore the order. Ignoring the order, or anybody ignoring the order, will amount to a high crime. I, 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 I get the argument you're making, but at the same time, uh, the other argument, which is backed by the, the same constitution that you're reading about interference in the work of another independent... I see, you uh, love the word um, interference. <laughs> you love the word interference. But, uh, you I, I, see, what... you love the word interference. But you see, I am saying that... Uh, let me read the law again for you, so that you know that what Parliament, what Supreme Court did, they were acting within the law, not outside the law. Please, and listen, the Supreme Court shall for the purpose of a declaration under clause one of this article, make such orders and give such directions as it considers appropriate for giving effect. Under the circumstances, based on the facts that the court was seized with and the law, the court in its wisdom said, look, at this stage, hold your hands. Uh, Speaker Babin, the only you are giving, hold your hands. Then let the people go back and take their seats until we determine the matter as to the interpretation and the foot of the Constitution. This, the Supreme Court did, was right. And it's said it's the country. Thank you very much, Mr. Gary Nimako. And Gary Nimako is the Director of Legal Affairs for the Governing New Patriotic Party. I've also had with us uh, Dr. Ishmael Yamsin, who is a renowned economist and business, respected businessman. And we've also had with us uh, Francis Poku. He's former National Security Coordinator, former National Security Minister. Uh, thank you so much for joining us on Agenda tonight. My name is Beatrice Edu. Coming up next is Ghana tonight. Join us again next week. Have a good evening.